Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the River Center. My name is Rick LaFaro. I'm the Executive Director of the Morning Corps Conservancy. We're thrilled you're here. Um, we, we'd like to welcome you to the second engagement of a brand new initiative and speaker series for us, known as the Watershed Institute. Uh, we have named the Watershed Institute after one of our founding members, Carter Brookshire. So this is the Brookshire Watershed Institute. Um, both the River Center and the Watershed Institute were um, <clears throat> near and dear to Carter's heart. And uh, when we opened the facility and throughout uh, the history of the organization, we were really wanting to um, span the educational offerings that we have. The foundation of this organization is built on education, and we do a wonderful job educating um, adults and school children throughout the entire valley, but we really wanted to run the gamut from uh, the most basic or elementary education to the highest level of learning. And so the Watershed Institute really exemplifies that, where we can bring in local water experts or visiting professors. Um, everybody that's in this room right now knows that water is the issue of our time, and you care about water and snow. And so we're trying to um, bring different topics to you, bring different speakers to you, um, <clears throat> welcome you with a little reception, and um, have some good presentations, but really some good dialogue. So I'm going to uh, pass the baton over to you, Christina Medved, who are, is our uh, Director of Community Outreach. Before I do so, I just want to thank Free Range Restaurant and Massaw for providing our um, wonderful charcuterie boards and whatnot. Um, if you're looking for a great place to go for dinner or drinks or both after this, this evening, please head on into Free Range and um, give them your business because they're taking good care of us. So, again, thank you all for being here this evening. Christina Medved. Thank you. So, um, I just wanted to add a couple more things to what Rick was mentioning about the Watershed Institute. Um, and we have hosted um, Watershed Institutes in the past. For example, um, we hosted the very first Riparian Summit in the Roaring Fork Valley that actually drew people even from as far away as Denver. Now, here's your first pop quiz question for tonight. Who's heard the word Riparian before? <laughs> Who can tell me what it is? Why is everybody hand? Everybody's hand is <laughs> <laughs> I think this young woman is Right here, the blonde in the middle. Wow. Wow. Tell us what a Riparian is. <clears throat> Riparians related to reptiles? <laughs> <laughs> Riparian is the habitat along the banks of a river. Mm, thank you. Yes. And we like them to be vegetated. Um, there's about 50 years worth of scientific data that tells us that those riparian areas are just as much a part of the river as the water is. That's how interconnected they are. So for us to host a riparian summit, we thought was important. We didn't realize it was going to have the kind of draw around the state that it, that it had. Um, another Watershed Institute we hosted was actually the Deputy Director for Water for the Environmental Protection Agency. Um, she was doing a little tour around the West and we were able to host her. What we're really excited about though, being in our own facility here, it's been about seven months now, is that we can host our own events now. <laughs> so, so thank you for being here. Um, this is the second of a three-part winter series that we have for the Berkshire Watershed Institute. Um, the third one I'll tell you about at the end of Dave's presentation tonight. Um, and then we hope to do a few more in the summer and then also in the fall. So the premise of the Watershed Institute is that we want to elevate this conversation of water. Okay, we want to elevate it because we are a very small watershed in a very large system. We're a very important watershed, a headwater watershed that helps feed 40 million people. And that's just in the Colorado River Basin. We're not even talking about where our water gets diverted to go in a different direction. So, and I can tell you more about that, after Dave's presentation. So um, without further ado, if I may, introduce you to Dave Kanzer. He is now the Deputy Chief Engineer at the Colorado River District. And Dave has been working on the complex web of water quality and quantity issues facing the Colorado River Basin for almost 25 years. Since 1995, he's focused on both large, regional, long-term water supply planning issues for the Colorado River, as well as smaller local implementation programs addressing water supply and demand imbalances, primarily due to growth and climate change. In addition to developing and implementing water use efficiency projects, Dave recently begun managing the Central Colorado River Basin Cloud Seeding Program, which is what you're talking about tonight, 
to help address water supply availability for multiple beneficiaries, including agricultural, municipal, environmental, and recreational interests. As an avid skier and boater, Dave takes his work with him seven days a week, 12 months a year. Wouldn't you like to be in a boat, though, if you're like on a raptor? His passion for water resource management has taken him from the peaks of the Colorado River watershed through the guts of the Grand Canyon, because I think we want to hear more about that, and onto vast savannas, plateaus, and irrigated valleys that make up the breadbasket and salad bowl of the southwest, you know, southwestern United States. Dave is a registered professional engineer in, in Colorado, earning his bachelor's and master's degrees in geological engineering from the Colorado School of Mines. Welcome, Dave. tonight and uh, see a whole lot of new faces, which is always a really cool thing, because one of our colleagues just the other night said, he goes to all these water meetings and he knows everybody in the room and they're sort of preaching to the choir. This is a whole new situation I know a few of you and I really appreciate you all coming out and support me and the, and the River Center here. It's my first time here at the River, well not first time, first time presenting and hanging out here. We have one meeting upstairs and coincidentally it was about cloud seeding. We talked about uh, with the Healthy Rivers Board from Pickham County, and um, it kind of, the whole thing, and uh, forgive the pun, it's sort of snowballing. Um, <laughs> especially for me, um, you know, you heard the bio, this, this is somewhat new for me, and um, I've been in sort of this um, field, if you want to say, for the last two or three years managing this program, and um, I'm going to go through uh, quite a bit of Info here, try not to overwhelm, uh, but we got lots of time, and I understand that my colleague Chris Trees was here, and he did a little differently, and he allowed people to, if they had questions, just jump in, and there's something on one of the slides, and I got a lot of slides, so maybe it's, it's cool if you just want to jump in and ask questions, and um, we can take from there, because again, we've got lots of time, and there is a lot of uh, information. Um, so, I'm going to start off. Hopefully this is going to wake up and work oh, for me. We've had a lot of technical on? difficulties today. Uh, have you been Dave tricking me? Are you turning the off on, on me? Yeah. That's, there we go. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. All right. So, um, we're going to overcome all the technical challenges, and it's going to work just like that. Oh, you... Um, okay, well, when, we have, we've had about six different backups so far. <laughs> um, I'm assuming, um, maybe, hopefully rightly, that you all know who the Colorado River District is. And if you were here a few weeks ago, Chris Trees um, talked about the Colorado River District, but I'll give you a little bit of background on our agency. We're, we're based in Glenwood Springs, and we... Um, I didn't put a slide up here because I thought this would be background info, but um, we have 15 counties in north and western Colorado. So that includes Pitkin, Eagle, Summit, Grand, and as we go uh, to the west all the way to the state line, down to Mesa County, all the way north to Wyoming border. And if this guy works for me, I'll show you right here. Uh, this part of the Colorado River Basin is our home in Colorado River District, and if you are a uh, property owner, I should thank you because you pay a small mill levy, and that pays my salary, and I really appreciate that, <laughs> that's why I'm here today. And so, um, the, the Colorado River District is really a, a planning and policy entity, so that means we advocate for uh, you all as um, <clears throat> residents in this area, and as we just heard, there's a lot of water that gets diverted to these shaded areas, whether it's in the front range of Colorado, uh, and you'll see that all around the basin, outside the, what we call the natural basin of the Colorado River, a lot of uses outside, and um, again, trans basin diversions, and that's why the Colorado River was set up uh, in 1937 to balance the powers so, uh, that be, and one of the largest Trans Basin Diversions, the Colorado Big Thompson Project that maybe you've all heard about out of Grand County. They were set up the same time we were, 1937. Um, and we advocate very uh, vociferously to balance those 
uh, demands and to keep water in the natural basin. But as you can see, it's not just Colorado. Mm -hmm. Wyoming has trans basin diversions, Salt Lake City, um, Albuquerque, uh, these interesting uh, long canals, the Central Arizona Project, and the All American Canal down here, and the Colorado River Aqueduct. This is Los Angeles. So the water that arises here in uh, your backyard services all these people. And it's about 40 million people at last count, and about 5 million irrigated acres. So that's um, obviously uh, a tall task, and we have a lot of challenges because of it. So I'm going to probably leave that background there, but again, if there's any questions about that, this, this map, I should just point a few more features, sorry. The upper basin and lower basin, we are all governed by a Colorado River Compact. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on Colorado River Compact, except that two features, Lake Powell and Lake Mead. Those are the storage vessels, the storage batteries, that really regulate all of the waters that flow uh, into the upper basin. And by compact or contract, the upper basin has to release a uh, set amount of water from this facility down to users in the lower basin. And so this line really represents, uh, as of 1922, a 50% line. 50% of the water that arises in this basin essentially gets delivered to this basin. Mm -hmm. And there's a whole lot to talk about in the Colorado River Compact, but that's not really exactly why you're here. But it is one of the reasons that we do cloud seed. It is one of the reasons why water supply, I'm going to spend a lot of time talking about water supply, and a little bit about water demand. So, um, again, at least my pointer works. Yeah, this one here would be great. <laughs> Thank you. Um, this plot for water wants like me really sets the stage and I'm going to try to stay away from a lot of plots but keep your eye on this side. The blue is water supply and you can see up and down and this is starting you know right around when the Colorado River Compact uh, was signed 1922. A highly uh, productive time in the Colorado River Basin. Um, that hovers right around the 15 million acre foot line goes up and down. We have been in a dry cycle here in the 2000s, and the demands, the use of that river has been going up. Once it crosses over, we are uh, headed for a problem. And you might wonder, how can you possibly have more demand than supply? Well, we have uh, those big reservoirs I talked about, and that's why we have been able to meet all of our needs uh, in this gap here, this gap region, but we're running out of the storage in those facilities. And when you look forward in time, these are projections, the red line almost certainly uh, based on projections, these are, and you can see kind of a uncertainty, a envelope around the demands and around the supply, because we know supply goes up and down. Demands are uh, nicely going down here thanks to conservation measures across the basin. But the projection is, right now, we have more demand, more people, more irrigated uh, acres than we have a long-term supply. And the long-term supply, of course, is challenged, so to speak, by uh, climate change and what people are starting to call aridification or a drying, right? And so this, is, this sets the stage for why we're really interested in fault lines. Again, I'm going to be talking about the blue line and the supplies. We're, we are working uh, actively on the red line and those demands. And of course, you all, how you use water can uh, affect that red line as well. My virtual button. So uh, how do we deal with it? We call up Captain Obvious, and he comes to the rescue and breaks it down. What we're trying to do is increase inflow and minimize outflow and the difference. This is a, a real simple equation, but it really defines how we um, operate our reservoirs, right? Inflow minus outflow, snowpack demands really determine what our reservoir levels are, what our supply is uh, in the long term. 
And so if you can kind of uh, grasp that, it really defines everything that we do. And we, we can do things here on demands, and we are. There's not a lot we can do with inflow except for augmenting the system through cloud seeding. Before we talk about that sort of augmentation or increase in those supplies, we talk about, well, you know, why are we so dry anyway? Or I had this fancy deal here. Um, this is that same Colorado River, and it shows where the precipitation is. And you will see a nice rim of blue where the precip rises between 35 to 65 inches per year. And that, we, we talk about inches of water, that's otherwise known as, uh, at least in the wintertime, snow water equivalent. So you may hear me say uh, SWE, snow water equivalent. What we're trying to do is increase that snow water equivalent. And we have opportunities in these blue and green areas to augment or increase that. And that's really what we're, we're talking about. <coughs> Again, just keep in mind, we're trying to feed and supply water in what is really an arid basin. The predominant um, signature is less than 10 inches of precip <coughs> per year. Okay? So that's, that's you know, it's obvious when you look down here in southern Arizona and western and uh, parts of Utah, of Moab, you know, we, we know this. The Colorado River Plateau is, is dominated by and characterized by lack of precip. So really, this these small areas, and again, the Colorado River District is right here, almost three-quarters of the water that flows into Lake Powell, which is right here on the border, um, arises right here in your backyard. And so we are really trying to maximize that um, opportunity. And if you have lived in the... In, this area for, or in Colorado, really, you can see huge swings in the snowpack from year to year. Last year, incredibly dry, incredibly pathetic if you're a skier like me, uh, versus this year where you're just celebrating almost every week, especially these last eight, six, eight weeks. So, um, how do we increase the inflows? What, where, um, and how, essentially? This is the, the basis of my talk today. Uh, tonight, I want to kind of go through this, the science and practices, and I think you'll be really surprised at how much cloud seeding is already going on. There's a whole lot of activity, not only in Colorado, but throughout the West. I want to uh, kind of bust, bust some of the myths that are out there about cloud seeding. A lot of people don't believe in it, don't think it's sort of a, a voodoo science, and I've got science and research here that really, um, hopefully I can... Uh, show you some compelling arguments. You're all, obviously going to all have to make your own decisions. Um, but there's a lot out there, and I'm going to provide some references there. And then, you know, the other way that we can increase inflows is, uh, if you've heard of tamarisk, Russian olive, those are what we call non-beneficial uses. They can um, pull the groundwater down, take that water, put it up into the atmosphere, and so we, we do have an active um, program to uh, look at and manage those um, uh, that vegetation. <coughs> so this is a little redundant. Captain Obvious is back in town. You know, we are trying to address these drought conditions, this, this drying uh, conditions that we're, we're seeing. And you can see I put drought in quotes. You know, our hydrologic record um, is pretty robust. It's in the Colorado River, over 100 years of records that we can see. And you saw that wavy line. Um, drought, in quotes, because there's other things going on, and that's essentially climate change. And so this shouldn't be a surprise to folks here. But uh, is it drought? Is it a new normal? Um, what, what's really going on? I'm not going to address so much on the, that part, um, but uh, it does deserve to be thought about. You know, If we're in a new normal, how do we mitigate the new normal of a drying climate or a drying basin? Uh, can't just say the whole climate is drying because it's really, um, the climatic signal is so variable. You saw those crazy changes in precip from 
over four feet of, of rain to less than a foot across the basin, right? Um, and that's happening uh, naturally as well. <coughs> so um, we are trying to augment those supplies, and we're, there's some other buzzwords here, drought contingency plans, <coughs> DCP, this has been in the news. All seven basin states are very concerned about um, this, uh, how, how do we get by, whether it's a drought or a natural or man-made condition, what are we going to do? How do we mitigate it? So we're all kind of working together, and there is a plan in place, well, on the verge of being in place. Again, there's issues in California and Arizona, and there's going to be federal legislation. You're going to be hearing a lot more about this if you uh, like to read the news like I do. Uh, cloud seeding can also do um, what a lot of us love to do and help us with our snowpack. We know that our seasons are shrinking. We're getting less snow in and more rain in our signal. Again, if you live here, uh, I've been here again almost 25 years. Last few years, the only time I've ever seen rain in March at the base of Aspen Island. And it's, it was shocking, but now it's, it's sort of hit my sight. It's, it's almost natural, almost expected now. And this storm right now, this warm storm, we may see rain at 8,500 8, feet. It's crazy. It's February, right? Tomorrow's March, but... Um, so, we need to adapt. We need to be ready. We need to um, plan for these sort of things. And again, we are turning to cloud seeding. And this is an older picture. It, with, I think it's kind of like that one on the wall there. It's, it really clearly shows what's going on. And... Um, what we're trying to do is increase the efficiency of the cloud. Typically, without augmentation, it takes 15 to 30 minutes for snow crystals to grow and fall out naturally in this what we call convective cycle, uh, with the airflow moving up, cooling, condensing. And if it doesn't go through that whole cycle, it can move all the way through the system and evaporate and stay in a, in a vapor and move out here without falling. So what we're doing is adding particulates, nuclei, into the cloud to increase the efficiency, shorten the time, and cause more to fall here, and less to be evaporated and to move out, and again, what I would say, non-beneficially. So, um, this, we're gonna go to a little bit more sophisticated set of pictures here, and show you some of the conditions. We can't seed every cloud. The clouds have to be, what we like to say, juicy. That means they have uh, liquid, super cool liquid water. That means liquid water below the point of freezing. That, again, is it hasn't fully condensed. It hasn't grabbed a nuclei or a particle to condense around. And so we're adding particles through these ground. This is a ground-based generator. Again, this cartoon shows you not only you have to have super cool liquid water in a juicy storm. You have to have the right temperatures and right wind pattern. Okay? It wouldn't do any good if you didn't have the uplift and just, you know, we're ejecting uh, particulates down here. You have to get into the right place, the right time, and the right amount. So it's, it's, a, it's a tricky deal. It's a scientific, it's scientifically proven, uh, but this is why there's a lot of uncertainty. We don't uh, we do monitor the temperatures, winds, and we can actually see into clouds now for this signature. Um, but we are relying on models most of the time on when to make these what we call operational decisions. Um, so you can kind of see the process, um, and, and I kind of mentioned it. I'm going to show one more picture of the same sort of thing, but it really takes the time. We're shortcutting the time, and uh, we can put those... Um, nuclei or particles into the clouds in several different ways, and I'll show you. Uh, right now, the majority, 99% of the programs are on the ground um, in these generators, and there's actually three in this basin, and I'll show you. And when I say this basin here, just up the frying pan and towards Aspen, um, where these are currently operating when the conditions are right. And so, same sort of thing, but one thing this one shows is that the reason silver iodide works is it's almost the same shape, hexagonal, um, 
the, the water molecule. And so they, they work together quite well. They come together, they freeze, they fall. Uh, this guy, this plane, has some uh, flares that also can vaporize silver iodide, and that can be very efficient. You can go right into the cloud, the right time, right place, and, but it's much more expensive, and it's a little bit dangerous. So um, the other thing that's really interesting in this, um, you, you, I mentioned about this sort of convective cycle where it causes um, the moisture to rise. This process can actually help that process and sort of continue the process and make, again, those clouds more efficient. So what does it look like? These are um, a lot of the machines and techniques that we just talked about, the plane, and there's different types. It's, it's really crazy. Uh, this uh, technology has just been adopted and permitted for the first time in Colorado. Uh, not here in this valley, but north here uh, in the North Platte Basin near Walden, if you know where that is. It's kind of a forgotten part of Colorado. It's outside the Colorado River Basin. But they now have a permit to do this. And they can uh, burn these flares in place, they call, or they can eject them. It's crazy. And you can just drop these things into the cloud, and they, they burn as they go, and they cause the whole profile of the cloud to condense essentially, and fall as snow. This is what we deal with here, though. Typically, we have about 25 of these. I'll show you where those are. These manual generators. you got a propane tank. You've got a solution. And you vaporize it. You wouldn't be running it on a day like this. But you would turn it on when the conditions are right, and you would vaporize into the clouds. Uh, but you need somebody to go out there when it's snowing and when the conditions are cold and nasty and uh, turn this thing on, and um, we do compensate people to do that, and it's on <coughs> private lands, but um, it's not the most pleasant thing, but the ranchers are a hardy type, and most of the folks that we deal with are ranchers, and they're used to getting up at all hours for their animals anyway. Um, but the lazy man's scheme is right here. This one is a, a remote generator, and this is, uh, I wanted to say that was on Grand Mesa, I think it's that one's on Grand Mesa, but I'm not positive. These can be controlled through the internet, and again, they actually vaporize, and the, the whole unit here is up here at altitude, all the materials in here. You can go inside here, stay warm, and run this thing. It's kind of amazing, or I should say, um, maintain it. You don't need to run it. You can run it again through telemetry, through um, antennas. This one is a whole new ball game. This is a liquid propane dispenser, and this is Grand Mesa. Um, we, don't, we only have one of these. Um, in our in Western Colorado that I know of, and it does something different. This is at uh, almost 12,000 feet, I think. So it's in the clouds most of the time. And the clouds come through, and all it does is it um, releases some liquid propane, and it quickly vaporizes, and in that process, basically freezes everything around it. It's, it's really pretty amazing. So you can um, see a whole <coughs> slew of different um, types of um, techniques. Just a few more pictures here. Uh, hopefully you can kind of see uh, what's going on. This one is in Woody Creek. Uh, as an example, this one is in Red Cliff. And they're just, these are just demonstrations. <coughs> so as we kind of uh, have just alluded to, there's, um, there's different makers of these remote control cloud scene generators. We talked about this one. Um, this is out of Nevada. This is a new one, brand new, just been uh, deployed this year for the first time. It's made in Idaho. Idaho is a real leader in um, remote cloud seeding. Um, <clears throat> same, same concept though, just a little different design. You don't have um, the protection. All your materials are here. There's a deck here. You get your solar panel and you've got your uh, propane and your uh, telemetry to, to talk to it. Um, very effective because again you can turn it on and off, or I should say very efficient. The effectiveness, uh, we'll talk about that more, but the efficiency is, is really head and shoulders and these can burn two, two and a half times the, the rate of silver iodide than the, the manual generator. So you would need two manuals to, to make up the output of this.
All right. So, a uh, lot going on in cloud seeding. This is where I said you may not uh, know how much is going on and how long it's been going on. In Vail since 76. Across the West, I'll show you a map, eight states, 40 countries. Uh, and, and this includes what we call warm season seeding as well. You know, places like Israel and in uh, Australia. Um, not only just looking for snow, they're looking for rain. And they also do crazy things like suppress hail. Um, which obviously can be very damaging, and so um, that that um, uh, <clears throat> represents a whole lot of different activities, right? Uh, the feds have been involved since the 90s, and because of this DCP, this drought contingency plan, um, it's likely that the federal government will get back into the game and invest. Right now, most of the funding is through state um, entities. I mentioned Idaho, Wyoming, really uh, another leader, just finished a 10-year study to uh, prove to themselves and their legislature that it's an effective technique. Um, in Colorado, we have nine permitted programs, everywhere from, all the way across the spine of the Rockies. I mentioned Jackson County. All the other ones are ground-based. And um, you'll, you'll see you know, all these places you know, know and love. A lot of the ski areas, but really we're doing this for water supply. Um, and there are a whole bunch of people contributing. It's not just uh, the River District who's managing it. Uh, we put in funds, of course, but lower basin states, and that's California, Nevada, Arizona, very interested in boosting that supply we talked about. And so we have a long-term agreement. Uh, it's been going since 07. Now it's been extended for nine years going forward. So it's just going to keep growing and I'm glad folks are here to kind of learn about this and not sort of be surprised because um, this this is going to be a bigger issue I think going forward. You can see uh, over a million dollars per year in Colorado. Most of that, um, more than half of that is from local sources. Uh, the CWCB, Colorado Water Conservation Board, they, and the state the legislature has um, seen fit to support that, and then the lower basin I mentioned are passing those monies up, half a million bucks a year to the uh, state of Colorado, and then down to folks like us at the Colorado River District. When you look at the, the map of the west, you can see the blue areas, that's where the cold season snow um, seeding is going on. Um, it's self-explanatory, but you can see those states that are in, those states that are out, and then these other really interesting um, programs that are trying to harvest rain, and you can see Canada is part of that too. There's, there's a whole lot of people um, studying and operating uh, programs across the West. So just a little bit more here before we uh, jump into some other aspects. Um, not only are we, excuse me, um, doing these operation and maintenance, we're, we're doing a lot of studying. And um, some pretty um, I don't want to say groundbreaking, but significant studies that are um, helping us understand the climatology or the weather. Um, how do those, those uh, particulates that we introduce, um, where do they go? Um, what are the prevailing winds? So we study that on a site-specific basis. We'd like to do that here in this valley as well. Um, and we're really trying to get out, educate folks, uh, further the, the research. Uh, be, be careful in how we um, cite these generators. And again, we've been doing this for a long time, so we want to make sure we're doing it right now that technology and the models have been refined. And um, I just kind of skipped over this, but right now, this is a regulated activity. The state of Colorado, through the Water Conservation Board, they issue the permits. And there's, as I mentioned, nine permits. I'm going to talk about one permit in the Central Mountains that, that again, uh, we, the River Districts, um, help coordinate and administer. <coughs> um, and so let's just jump into that one particular um, program, hopefully. Oh, before I do, uh, I brought this. This is sort of the, the de facto Bible for um, cloud seeding. And this is available online. And I can pass this around if folks are interested. It, it shows a bunch of um, maps, information, studies. Uh, a lot of this stuff I'm going to talk about, 
um, the permit itself. And um, so if you're interested, basically you can you can read this and follow up. And at the end of this um, presentation, you'll see some of the uh, links. Um, I would like to get that back. So. That's on the Colorado River District website? It will be on the Colorado River District website. It's actually on the Colorado Water Conservation Board website right now. That's a good, good question. Could you quickly explain the relationship between the silver iodide and propane? Yes, yes. Um, so, um, essentially, we put the silver iodide, which is a solid, into solution. It goes into acetone, which is the solvent, which is a flammable solvent, but it's not as flammable as we need. So we um, use the propane as an accelerant or a propellant, really a better way to say it, a propellant. It goes through the, the uh, orifice, and then it's ignited, and that helps um, free the silver iodide particulate matter. It gets into the um, convective cycle and gets into the cloud. And I think we may have a few more um, images of that, but that's a good question, and that's the basis of how the uh, generators work. So if we can jump in here again. Um, a surprising amount of triangles, the green triangles, over 100 of them here on the spine of the Rockies in Colorado, Continental Divide, um, are actively working today and through the season. Um, what you'll see here are the different permitted areas, these, these different lines. This is the Gunnison, Grand Mesa. Here's our central Colorado. Uh, we are right down here. Um, this is Aspen. We're probably somewhere here. Uh, Garfield County, Lemon Springs. And so the blue shows sort of some of the targets. And the SWE, that's snow water equivalent, we're trying to get into those areas and enhance those, right? Um, and then you'll also see some yellows. These are some potential areas that we're trying to um, deploy some additional remote cedars, so, so those expensive cedars. They're about 40,000 bucks a shot. So we're trying to upgrade and build and deploy about one or two of those a year in our permit area. Same time, our friends in the Gunnison are doing that, all the way down to the Dolores, San Juan, uh, programs and up to Grand County. So um, a lot going on there and a lot of times you show this to people like, wow, I had no idea that this was going on. Um, go the next one. So as we zoom in, and this is kind of hard to see, but the same map is that central mountain, central Colorado region. You'll see different colors. These are all, um, except for this one, these are all in place and operating. But the reason they have different colors is they're shared between different programs. Uh, different targeting winds may uh, favor this area, so you'll turn on a set of these, and different uh, funding partners will pay for some of those. And in fact, the, the red ones is rail, uh, right? So when prevailing winds are good from the northwest, <coughs> that's one of the more effective, um, I'll call them vectors. When, this, when you get a storm coming through, it's cold. It's, this is veil right here. You turn on these, and you can see it's well upstream, well upwind. And, and these, um, the material, when you put it into the cloud, can travel uh, 50 miles or further. And you can see that's why it's so far away from the target area in green. Right here, this is, uh, these two are, right here, this is Aspen. Um, you'll see a different shade. This is not currently being seeded here. We are... Um, Hopefully, depending on how uh, you all and your colleagues and, and citizens in Pitkin County decide, may be expanding into this region. And this is important because City of Aspen gets their water supply here. You may have been reading, they don't have a lot of storage, and that's uh, a concern. So they're really interested in augmenting uh, Castle Creek, Maroon Creek, and it just so happens that their skier is right there. So we're working with the ski co and talking about. Um, is there a partnership there that we can put together? But uh, suffice to say, this other region is getting seeded by all these different ones, depending on the, again, the prevailing winds, the storm, the temperature, um, and uh, the juiciness. 
One other thing you'll see is this area. Um, recent climatological studies have indicated that this area, as well as this area, have a high potential. More than 60% of the storms that come through, or events, precipitation events, meet the criteria. And so we're looking at how can we expand and, and really take advantage of this and this area for that reason. And those studies that were performed by the National Center for Atmospheric Research um, so that's why that's there, and that's the map. And um, um, this is probably another Captain Obvious slide. Um, the ski areas are trying to um, increase early snowfall. That's what the ski areas are interested in. <coughs> we're interested in the entire winter season, and we're really trying to get as much water uh, out of the clouds as we can. Our target area is above 8,500. We talked about these counties. Uh, in my program, so to speak, we have 29 manual generators and now these two remotes, and it operates almost six months a year in our permit to uh, take advantage of these. Another map that kind of zooms in, shows the different um, generators, shows that Vail is fully embedded within our permit area, and so we get a double bang for the buck theoretically when they are seeding because some of it can sort of spill out into our country or when we are seeding and we have a storm in from the west they may get some advantage from us and so you can see quite a few <coughs> not only seeders but we have uh, snow tail sites and I understand the conservancy is going to take a tour of snow tail site which is those automated um, measurement devices that are deployed and we use those um, in non-seeded areas, the ones that we're not seeding in, what is the snow accumulating? And then we compare that to our areas that are seeded, develop a relationship, uh, what we call a regression. When uh, that regression is uh, statistically significant, we can determine the benefit of our activities. And that's one of the key things that we use to um, um, Again, report out some of the numbers you're going to see on the benefit of our program. So, uh, I may have mentioned this already, but we not only have Vail in, in different ski areas, uh, we have our friends that um, divert and use water on the, on the east side, right? But the interesting thing is we're not seeding for their physical water supply. We're seeding in the Colorado River Basin to help offset their depletions or their use to keep Lake Powell and as part of this drought contingency. We're all getting together trying to make sure that levels in Lake Powell don't fall below critical levels because that would then call, call them out. That would impact their ability to use water. So we have this interesting cooperative program um, and again it's, it's important because this is becoming an expensive practice, we spend about, in this Central Mountain region, uh, over $200,000 a year. And they are kicking in, uh, all together with those entities, about $75,000. Um, and I mentioned this, and I, but I think it bears repeating. The lower basin states are throwing in um, into our program probably on the order of $50,000 a year. And that's a long-term situation. So. Um, I think I've said most of these things, but um, we are moving forward to try to leverage the funding, bring in new partners, and increase our participation and our, our stake in the game. Um, and I guess <clears throat> another way to put it is to be good partners to the other lower basin users. Um, and <clears throat> I guess I should spend a moment on this. What what system water? So. Nobody owns the additional precipitation, right? It goes into the system, it benefits everybody along the way. So Aspen, if they were in the program, could use it and return it. And <clears throat> the way that the hydrology works in the Colorado River Basin, as long as it's not diverted out of the basin, it gets used and reused along the way. So that it doesn't, um, there, there's nobody saying, hey, that's my water. It's, um, some people say, High tide lifts all boats. That's the concept. 
to that point, are, are you guys, the district, targeting areas for increasing the suite that are not impacted by collection systems for translation versions? I know it's not exact. <coughs> it's, it's not exact. Your question, if you didn't hear, is how are we targeting? Are we targeting their ability to convert that water? And the, the basic answer is no. Um, we're trying to hit the productive watersheds that help um, supply water to the, to the west slope, but there is some spillover, and later in the presentation you'll hear me say, well, you know, it can travel 50 miles, but some studies have actually said it can travel 200 miles. This whole issue about, and I don't want to get ahead of myself, I'll come back to it, but um, we do, depending on the models and the storm, have a really reasonable idea of how things um, are flowing and affecting, but um, there's a lot of uncertainty. Anything in science subject to uncertainty? Yeah, two questions. Uh, one, have you made any estimates as to the increased amount of water mm -hmm. that you have generated yep, yep. with the program? And then uh, second, uh, uh, do our neighbors in uh, Kansas and Nebraska uh, well, say, both, you're taking some of our water? Those are uh, both great questions. I'm going to get to both of those so you can hold on. And uh, hopefully we get to those quickly. Uh, and actually, this one kind of shows your first question. So last year was a dry year. You all remember that. Um, a few things happened. We renewed the permit. I mentioned about the Colorado Water Conservation Board. We got five more years. For again, I'm talking about the Central Colorado program. Each permit has different conditions. That's ours. But we have a goal. We had a goal in 17, over 2,000 hours of generator time. Because it was so dry, we only uh, we're able to seed in those conditions by half that. Um, so we didn't spend our whole operational budget and we carried forward into this year. And I'll show you what happens uh, this year, much different. But here's that estimated benefit you just asked about. And this is a statistical estimate based on those areas that are not seeded and those areas that are seeded. And um, it's not very precise, but uh, over our whole uh, permit area, we're pretty confident we're generating over 50,000 acre feet uh, even in a dry year. Um, and this this, is a, this cost here is a little bit, um, I would say, a little misleading. But all we're doing is taking the operational budget of, uh, per hour and then dividing it um, by this these numbers to get to this. There's a lot more to it, and I, I probably need to dig down because of um, operate the maintenance part, the permitting costs, and so um, it, this is a generous number, but it's extremely cheap. Even if you triple, quadruple, multiply by 10, multiply by 20, you don't get that kind of water. Um, and that market from the city of Aspen can tell you, you know, for them to develop a new water supply, you're talking six figures, almost, uh, if you bring the capital costs and the operating costs. What is acre feet? Thank you. Um, so an acre foot, kind of what it sounds like if you took an acre of land and you stacked the uh, water on it one foot high, that's the volume. And um, it's kind of a, a, like a football field, uh, I think 18 inches deep. Is the, I think the so when you say 51,000 to 61,000 acre feet, that's in that whole upper and lower basin area that you were talking about, or just the upper basin? Just in our, just in our central mountain area where we have 29 generators. Okay, so to put you. that into context, we uh, typically talk about millions of acre feet. Mm -hmm. So in the whole uh, big polygon that is the Colorado River Basin, you're talking about 15 million acre feet in a, in a good or average year. And so that, that pales, right? That pales in significance. Um, what we're trying to do, though, is provide that volume of water to our local users and allow that water to accumulate over time in Lake Powell. And um, in, in another way to look at this, 100,000 acre feet is about <coughs> one foot in Lake Powell. And if you've been to Lake Powell, you can know how big that is. It can hold about 24 million acre feet. Um, so it, it's hard to throw your arms around it, but that's, those are some of the, the ways to compare. But that's a good question. 
Can we take it? Can I throw out one more just um, for some local perspective? Rudai Reservoir is 103,800 feet, so that'll give you an idea. Thank you for that. That's a really good local. Five more minutes, Jax. Okay. I had all the time in the world, you said. You're right, I did. Go for it. Okay. Uh, yeah, I know you all have a lot to get back to. Um, I'm just thrilled by this stuff, so I'm uh, going a little too slow. Um, but good questions, good discussion. This is a winter year. This is this year. We've already pretty much expanded our total operational budget. Luckily, we had that carryover. We've already had uh, more events, and we expect this weekend. This weekend could be two more, as an example. We're going to have a nice juicy storm. We're probably not going to be seeding because we talked about how warm it is. It's not going to meet those criteria. There may be other parts of the state where those conditions are met. Um, so anyway, we're anticipating a, a greater benefit. The, the more that we can produce, the less it costs. That's really why those numbers are in here. And I'll try to speed up a little bit here to get these other tough questions and sort of the myths. Um, this this is a, a, a tough one too. A lot of people don't believe that it works. It's voodoo. We, uh, the, the proverbial we, the industry, has embarked in multi-year studies uh, using pretty robust statistics, um, even trace chemical evidence that shows this is in Australia, this is in California, this is in Wyoming, this is in Idaho, different locations using the same um, techniques to measure some uh, model and statistical approaches. But really the um, um, bottom line is per storm, you can increase snowfall up to 15%, and that's a range, really zero to 15%. Um, and you can kind of see that same pattern uh, from these different studies. And then I want to talk about this one a little bit, but I'll... Um, can you be more specific when you say multi-year studies? So Wyoming, for example, this one here, was a 10-year study um, in these areas where they would monitor, they monitor for 10 years, and they um, published this study. Again, this is in that booklet. The executive summary is in here. So that's the one I'm most familiar with in terms, and that's just north of the Air Force. Um, I'm not sure about the time frame on these. Um, I'm going to have to go back and do some homework on that. Um, but, but typically, the multi-year, you want to have that reproducibility. You want to show that one year um, is not just an anomaly, right? Sure. Um, this one, SNOWY in Idaho, uh, that's an acronym. Um, again, it's written up in there. The first time <coughs> that they used uh, high resolution <coughs> radar, and intensely uh, monitored and observed what happens when you inject in these clouds. And they were able to uh, put the material right in the clouds using planes, and they had flight lines. They had flight lines going one way, and then they had radar going the other way. And they could see the change in the radar signal hmm. of the seeding. And um, the next time you see me, I'm going to have some really cool colored maps of that. But <laughs> it's in some of that. Um, report there, but that was really the first time in <clears throat> visual proof. Now, some people say, well, okay, it's snowing in the clouds, but did it get down on the ground, and did it uh, do what you're saying in terms of the water supply? <coughs> Those are where the research is ongoing. There's a lot of uncertainty. Um, <coughs> there's a lot of loss between the clouds and the ground, and um, as you know, clouds are, and weather are pretty, pretty chaotic. Um, for us locally in our central Colorado, this is a cool map. Um, this is based on that uh, statistical look on a dry year. These are increases in snow, or sweet, excuse me, over an inch of sweet in these areas. Um, the yellow is a quarter inch. And so these are statistically significant changes in sweet in this area through the model. And, um, Again, it, we could drill down and talk about this more, but um, we're hoping in this year to see multi-inch, <coughs> more, more purple and more blue going forward. <coughs> so, and this one is a little bit redundant. Captain Obvious is back in town. Um, yeah, just talking about that snowy and the how the seeding lines were tracked <coughs> and the evolution was documented, but 
again, if, you, if you're able to, we're going to archive this, I assume, or we'll make this available. If you're a geek like me and want to see the study, this, I put this up here for that reference. Um, here's that question that was asked about, well, what about Kansas? Um, this is a, what I call a common misconception or myth, robbing Peter to pay Paul. Uh, same sort of thing, multiple lines of evidence, multiple studies have shown <coughs> that we can't see um, how um, any locally increase in rainfall in one area deprived another area of its normal rainfall. This is a quote out of this report, 78, 2004. <coughs> A conclusion uh, statement. Uh, rainfall is, in, is increased downwind, um, and the, even as the seeded clouds move out of the target area, um, we can see, um, I should have said this up here, an extra area effect. And in fact, not only does it increase the local, what this is saying is it's actually increasing the downwind areas as well. So it's not. Uh, and if we go to the next one, the next conclusion is in bold here. Um, it benefits both Peter and Paul. And this is again a quote, I didn't make this up. But this, so this has been going on for a while. This is from 2012. And um, so these systems increase locally. And I think the other thing that they're saying is it's, you can measure on a very small model area or a small measured area. Once you go to a larger area, those effects become de minimis or impossible to measure. And so that's that's the basic question. A lot of people are still asking these questions and don't buy um, these studies, and people are still doing the same thing, um, still studying to try to um, get past that, that issue. Um, you know, the bigger issue for <clears throat> what determines where the, the moisture falls is the fiscal barrier. When you go across uh, into the Great Plains, into eastern Colorado, it's because of the fiscal barrier and the rain shadow effect. It's not because we're increasing the efficiency of the clouds here. Um, and so the other question that we talked about quite a bit, is it safe? Um, same sort of thing where multiple lines of evidence um, show no negative impact to the environment. Again, you, you're going to have to, I think, convince yourself here, and we're going to be talking about this. We're bringing in an expert on eco, <coughs> excuse me, don't to say, ecotoxicological impacts, March 14th in Aspen, and we welcome you all to come to that. Where That's is going that? to be at the Pitkin County Courthouse, and we're going to be sending out info. I don't know if there's a uh, mailing list, Christina, but yeah. we can provide that as well as the... Um, the link to this, but I want to just uh, cut to the chase. You know, um, this this is what the, the this is a quote. The literature shows no environmental harm um, arising from this silver iodide. Let me talk about what it is. Here's the reference. Um, silver iodide is not that rare. Mm -hmm. It's a um, stable compound. It's not an ionic compound. Ionic compounds, as you may know, are much more reactive. This is a stable compound, um, and in fact, some antiseptics use it. Um, you can see these are in photography. Um, this is what it is. Um, it's naturally occurring as well. Those are some of the, the um, good. Thanks. Um, the way the way it uh, hangs out in nature, and so this is what I was trying to get at between silver iodide, a um, stable. Um, compound um, inert and pretty small and we're talking when it goes out into the environment uh, in places where you've done a lot of seeding if you can find it you would find it in parts of the trillion um, it's very hard to find uh, in fact in your mouth if you have uh, silver amalgams you're probably dealing with more silver than uh, you would find in the environment um, so this is kind of the reason, again, um, it doesn't react, it's inert because of this, this chemistry. It's not bioavailable, it doesn't bond, and so there's no bioaccumulation. Now, if you had a silver ion, that does pose a risk. So when you go up and downstream of some, uh, up valley, excuse me, and downstream of some of the, the silver mines, that's where you will find um, 
free associated um, silver ions, and that's a problem, and that's what's different about it. Um, we talked about this a little earlier. It's that the, the shape and the size makes it very efficient. Um, excuse my interruption, because oh, I don't no. want to worry you. I mean, I've got time um, to know about it. So you were saying that it's not bioavailable, and right. it doesn't like build up in the environment. So where does it go? What happens to it? So it's a dust-sized particle, um, and obviously if you had things that can measure in terms of parts per trillion, and there are some instruments, very difficult to do, you would find it. And in fact, some snow pits, you know, they, they use it in a sense to, to prove that it's working because it goes up in the clouds, snows, and goes in the snow pit, and they have shown studies where they can measure it in a very controlled situation. So the dust-sized particles can be in the snow, but it's dispersed over such a large area that it makes it very difficult. So it's in the environment. When you say dust size, what does that mean specifically? Uh, you mean like in nanometers? I mean, it's just like a really <laughs> general term that I would like to know more about, a dust size particle. Like. Um, I thought that was a good way to describe it. <laughs> <laughs> I would have to come up with a, a I mean, they, they would measure it. 20, 20, yeah. micro, 20 to 50 microns, yes. something like that. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Is that, you is that, that I, I, might, I hope that you'll find that out for yourself <clears> and be able to be more specific. Sure. Yeah, yeah but it, it's in terms of, terms of microns and, and so we can I can add that to my um, next presentation. Thank I appreciate you. that name. <laughs> um, still not working. Um, so, uh, we're getting close to the end. And uh, appreciate your patience. So not only are we monitoring and uh, being careful about how we handle the materials, but we're um, limited under our permit on when and how much we can see. If we're in a critically wet year, we need to be careful. We're not causing avalanche, we're not jeopardizing highways. And, uh, we are not here yet, but um, you can see the number goes down as you get later in the year because you have more snow. Excuse me. And um, we're probably in some areas 120% of average this year in, in these point locations where the snow tail measures. Uh, regionally, we're probably only about 110, depending on where you look. But that's a really good problem to have. We would love to be here and not have to see. But we just want you to know that we do have criteria that govern how we. Um, the program. So what's next? We're going to try to, um, and I mentioned this, expand all these uh, activities, uh, make sure that the folks are comfortable and understand what's going on. And this one is, is a tough one. We need to coordinate all those different permit areas to make sure we are um, in sync, but we have different um, beneficiaries, um, funders, and, and operators, so it makes it a little challenging, but that's where we're going to be going. Um, I kind of promised a little bit, I would just mention about the non-native piece. Uh, this uh, map shows 1.6 million acres, this is in 2011. Each one of these red dots is essentially some nasty, noxious weeds that are consuming water. That water is taken out of the groundwater, that groundwater doesn't make it to the river. So there's a, a program to try to address that, again, to augment or to protect the water supplies across the west. Um, probably don't need to spend a lot of time here, but again, more references for folks that are curious. In Grand Junction, there's a whole uh, NGO, a non-governmental entity called Rivers Edge West that's working on this stuff, and it's pretty fascinating. USGS worked on it. The, the main, uh, actually the next slide, I'm sorry. So it, it consumes a whole lot of water. Um, and if you look at it, it can affect almost half an acre foot per acre. Now, I'm not saying that that's for the whole 1.6 million acres, but you can imagine that that um, small number gets really big for the whole landscape. And so people are working on this, and if you haven't heard about these cool little beetles, they release these beetles. Again, it's, it's kind of like cloud seeding. You know, people say, well, why are you messing with Mother Nature? Well, we've already messed with Mother Nature, now we're trying to. I think rescue her in, in a sense, and as an engineer, that's sort of my mindset. I know that doesn't always um, ring true with everybody else, but they have introduced these sterile bugs.
to go out and eat tamarisk, and it's been incredibly effective. More resources here, a lot of the, the, the links and references I promised you, um, and on, even on the uh, tamarisk and Russian olive stuff. And so here we are at the end of the thing. This is one of those manual cedars taken about a week and a half ago. Remember that crazy storm that hit Durango? This, this is totally inundated. And um, in terms of SWE, when you look at the SWE measurements, the um, snow water equivalent, they got about seven inches of water in about 10 days. And so you probably know that the southwest and the Four Corners areas under incredible drought last year. In particular, that was the bullseye and, uh, of drought, and it's sort of the bullseye now of recovery. And it's been really uh, <coughs> probably godsend for, for that region um, in the San Juan Basin. So I've um, done over my time, and I appreciate your patience. But I, was, I was told I had all the time in the you world. You were. I, that is true. I did tell you so that. I do appreciate all your interest in the time. minutes for some questions, oh, yeah. group questions, yeah. and then we'll, um, I have a couple of things I'd like to add after that, and then if there's some personal dialogue you want to have with Dave afterwards, that is one of the other intentions of the Watershed Institute, is that you can engage with the people that we see at meetings all the time, right? And we, we wanted to bring water leaders to you so that you can talk to them and ask them some questions. So why don't we take a few questions, and then we'll take a break. Does anybody have a question? One right here. You can call on people. Yes. You call on people. Thank you, yeah. person, just Thank to be you. Fair. I just have two brief questions in review. Um, you said that your one of the main goals is to reduce the time of the formation of the water crystals, um, but I didn't hear. Maybe I missed it. How by how much time you are reducing that process? Again, it's, um, <coughs> except in the lab, and they do believe it or not have these things called cloud chambers where they can measure. See um, whether or not that uh, corresponds to what we see in nature. Probably a stretch, and maybe this is another one I need to add to my next presentation. I don't know um, the exact um, change in the lab, but I'm going to suggest it's probably about uh, half or three quarters less time, or 25% less time is a better way to say it, or half. Um, also, I'm, I'm not, uh, I am a little bit familiar with the idea of cloud seeding, and I've seen a long list of other iodides um, and other uh, seeding materials. Do you only use, including, including silver iodide? And um, desiccated red blood cells. No, that's not where I was going. That's not where I was going. Sorry. That's not where I was going. But I, I wanted to ask. Are you familiar with other seeding materials personally with, with your experience in the industry and does your company specifically only use silver iodide? Yes, our program, and so I work for the Colorado River District, we're a public agency and we do hire companies. The companies that we hire only use silver iodide. Um, some of the other techniques that we talked about, the airborne, uh, aircraft based, um, and uh, can use other materials and it also depends on the season so for the cold season seeding and snow it's almost exclusively silver iodide when you go to the warm um, season seeding for rain they use salts um, and other uh, chemicals and i'm not that familiar with those but um you never heard about desiccated red blood cells that's interesting. Um, so, yeah, suffice to say, for us, silver iodide in an acetone bath, uh, fired by propane, and I did mention the liquid propane. Yes, you we said that you dissolve that silver iodide in an acetone. Yeah, yeah. And then you use the propane to isolate the silver iodide when it's in the atmosphere to, to vaporize it. Okay. But what I, what I was saying, in addition to that, we don't do this in our program, but on Grand Mesa, they have a liquid propane generator, which is only liquid propane, and because of a hydro or thermodynamics, they eject the liquid, they vaporize the liquid, it's not vaporized, but they, they atomize the, the, the liquid propane, and because of thermodynamics, it expands quickly and uh, 
cools everything around it. And so that's a different technique entirely, but that's another material, another approach, and that's for warm, warmer storms. Remember I talked about we have to have do negative 5 and negative 15 degrees Celsius. For those that are warmer, they can use this liquid propane. So is that process you don't use silver ice? No. Um, I, uh, this has been going on in the cloud cities for many, many years, the idea of it. And I was wondering about outside the United States, places like Switzerland and the Alps, and then the Himalayas now, say, where you've got a lot of drought in India. Um, uh, where are they in this? Are they, they should be pretty sophisticated in Switzerland, I assume. Yeah, um, I'm going to probably have to phone a friend on this one. I don't know just the details on that. The, um, I would say yes, particularly in places like, I know about Israel, I know about Australia, I don't know about Switzerland, and I don't know about um, India or the, the Himalayan um, area, but I assume that those areas, and even South America, are looking at this because across the globe, we're seeing this change in climate and water stress, and so that's um, really what's driving, I think, the industry. Uh, not only here domestically, but internationally. And again, I'll have to add another slide. Uh, what meteorological input do you get to decide when to pull a trigger? That's a, that's a great one. Um, so uh, airports, <coughs> like here in Pitkin County, um, have some sophisticated, um, well, throughout the basin, there are um, a whole cooperative network of weather stations. Uh, in addition, those weather stations are hopefully uh, situated uh, in an area that can advise us and inform us about our particular generators in those storms. In it, and all the, that network of weather stations feeds into these models. And these models, the same, same weather um, forecast that you see on TV, that information guides the decision making. But um, what I started to go to was at certain airports, and I believe Pitkin County has this, they have these vertical profilers, and they can see that super cool liquid water. And so we would look at that, we would look at the winds, we would look at the time, and, and so we're, we're not doing it at the Colorado River District, our vendors are doing this. We have the, our meteorological, meteorological experts, our vendors that are running the, the program, we are and you just and pay am, for it, and they tell you when to pull the trigger? Yes. And then you pull the trigger. They pull the trigger. <laughs> they pull the trigger. They pull the trigger. So it's a cooperative effort. They own the equipment, except for these remotes. The remotes, we're buying the remotes, uh, and deploying them, and then they're operating for, for us on our behalf. But the bottom line is they're looking at the weather data. They're looking at the models. They're trying to anticipate, based on those models, the window of time. Uh, that the conditions are right, the elevation, and then which cedar. That's why they're, the other reason there's so many cedars, right? It's not that they're all turned on at the same time. We're, we're turning on those that, uh, and again, I'm sorry for Captain Obvious, but to hit those target areas that are um, downwind based on those conditions. So hopefully that, that covers your question. Thank you. Sure. Am I wearing you out yet? DK. I want to tell you that I really admire you wanting to come up with solutions for this environment because it, I feel scared thinking that there's no water up here in the mountains, right? And it all falls down, you know, like into these areas like this lower basin. However, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be vulnerable in this moment and say that like the idea of cloud seeding is equally terrifying because it's addressing a symptom rather than the root of an issue mm -hmm. and yeah, you know I I'll be honest and say that I came to this talk thinking that this was like about the dangers of cloud seeding yet here you are selling it to me you know what I'm saying? <laughs> and, and I'm I feel privileged to to be able to sit here and like receive this information from you a person that's in the industry and like believes in this you know what I'm saying like it's really important to me to know about what's going on. And I've, I've been seeing it for years, and like I can come up with lots of like ideas of what's going on, right? Like conspiracy, I'll be honest, conspiracy. And um, so 
I guess the point is just that, um, like, I feel uneasy either way, right? Drought or cloud seeding. Like, I have a three-year-old daughter, and, and I want her to have a good life, you know? And I want her to have what she needs. Yeah, you know, I, can, I, I hear that, and, and your concerns, I think, have been heard, and a lot of that education and, and outreach that we're trying to, and the reason I'm here today, other than the invite, is to provide the information, um, provide the references. Everybody has to make their own assessment. Um, um, there, there are uh, those that I think do accuse sort of the conspiratorial um, <coughs> angle, and um, I, I personally, again, mentioned I'm more of a technocrat. I'm more of a um, solution-oriented person. If we, what you said, I think uh, I should respond to is that climate change is the issue. Fossil fuels is the issue that's causing climate change. Um, that's a good place to be spending your time and effort. Um, for us at Colorado River District trying to affect um, global change in um, emissions is very challenging. So we're taking this tact along with others and then the whole concept about well, don't mess with Mother Nature. Well, we have screwed over Mother Nature. What do we do to mitigate what we, the problems that we've already um, performed? We have dams. We have diversions. We have, I mean, how do we go back? <coughs> Can we go back? Or do we go forward? And again, this is a decision that everybody has to make, right? It's, yeah. it's one of these philosophical things, and, and we are a tax-based entity. Don't um, want us to do this, or Pitkin County to do this. You, your voice can be heard. Um, so I don't know what else to say. It's Thank just, you. It's a, it's a tough, tough one. Yeah. Um, so we can we can chat some more afterwards. Yes. Thank you so much for staying extra and all the great questions. Yes. So maybe tomorrow, maybe Monday. But you will get an email from us. You'll get a link to where you can download the book that Dave passed around. Um, and there's a couple other things on there. Size of a dust particle, <laughs> um, snow tell information. Yeah, so there's a, bunch, there's a, there's a list of help. stuff you'll get. So um, the other thing I want to tell you is that this was is being live recorded on our Facebook page right now. But tomorrow what I will do is upload. Yeah, everybody say hi. I will upload it tomorrow to our YouTube channel. That's another link that I will send you all. Uh, because then you can also see Chris Trees' presentation, who's the external affairs manager for the River District. He was here two weeks ago talking about the Colorado uh, Compact Call, the upper basin, the lower basin, like those specifics. So you can watch his presentation or even listen to it. Um, that's why Dave didn't dive into that, because he assumed a lot of you maybe you were here last time and heard some of that information. So please, that's why we're videotaping this, so you all can go back and hear it. So um, so how do we in the Roaring Fork we in the Roaring Fork watershed and here at the Roaring Fork Conservancy address some of these bigger, bigger picture, um, complex, very complex um, issues, if you will. Um, one of the things that we do, if you're not already receiving it, is every week we release um, a report that looks like this. It's, this is our stream pack and snow pack report. This is totally free. Uh, we use the data that's generated at the, the snow tell sites that they talked about um, by different government entities, and we, we put it in a report, really a graphic report, that shows you what's the current snow water equivalent in the Roaring Fork watershed. What are the flows in our rivers? And then in the summer and spring and summer, we're obviously reporting stream flows. The neat thing about this too, though, is up at the top there's a summary. So we give you a little bit of interpretation of what you're looking at in case you're like, I don't know what this number means. It's probably in here. That's, you know, sort of the job. We feel like that's our job is to translate some of the more technical uh, science information. Dave also gave, oh, by the way, if you want to sign up for this, if you go out to the front desk, there's a little... Um, there's a little binder you can put your name on on this email list. The other thing is Dave mentioned that on Saturday, March 9th, 
Well, he didn't tell me that date, but he said that we are doing a field trip to a snow tell site at, top of, at the top of McClure Pass. Please don't try to go to one on your own. It is federal property. You're not allowed to touch it. You're not allowed to go in it. But with us, you can go in it because we're going to be with the person who manages that snow tell site. Um, it's 9.30 to 12 o'clock on Saturday, March 9th. I put some of these flyers up there. Um, it's only $15, and that gives you um, coffee or tea, some breakfast refreshments, an instruction from our education program manager, and then someone from the National Resources Conservation District, sorry, NRCS, Natural Resources Conservation Service. Uh, he's the gentleman that manages that snow tell site. Then you're going to go up, carpool up to McClure Pass, snowshoe to the actual site, and you're actually going to dig a snow pit. You're actually going to measure how much water content is on is in all these different levels of snow. It's super awesome. If you has anybody here done this program with us before? Only, only eight. It's awesome. You guys, I only have 20 spots available. So if you're interested, we can even register you tonight if you're interested. Um, the other, the third thing. Um, and then I'll go ahead and I'll close this out, is that the third part of our winter speaker series is on March 11th, and that will be someone from Rivers Edge West, which Dave just talked about. Um, Kara uh, is our Education and Outreach coordinator is, coordinator, is going to come and talk to us about restoring this critical riparian habitat in the age of invasives. Dave, did you just say it was 1.6 million acres? That is Tamaris. So the new question is, as we were talking about climate changing, are there new invasives we need to be looking out for also? So um, so she'll be here, she's really, she's great. So again, come 5.30 uh, to 7.30, um, it's free. Um, and is there anything else? Oh, we have a lot of um, adult education programs that we do also in the summertime. In the summer though, they're mostly outside. They're all actually all outside. So please check out our website. Um, and I would say about 99% of them are free um, because of our relationships with different agencies and cities. So please check out our website. Please come to some of our programs. Um, one of the most popular programs, I'll just do a plug for this too, is um, we tour the fifth largest transbasin diversion tunnel in the state of Colorado. So the water that's moving water from the west to the east. There's 24 major tunnels that do that. Uh, they're usually big enough to fit a pickup truck in them, if not bigger, just to give you an idea. The fifth largest one in the state is on the headwaters of the Roaring Fork River. I lead that tour only once a year, and I only have 27 seats. So if you're interested, check out our event page, see when registration goes live, register the day it goes live, because it usually fills within a day or two. Um, Rick, is there anything else you want to add before we close out? April? Dave mentioned that there's another presentation with some experts on March 14th. Can you tell us a little bit more about that one? Yes, so we'll include this in the email. Um, so, as I said, I'm, I'm not really not the expert, I'm just playing one here on TV, but um, <laughs> we're going to bring in a few uh, doctoral level folks to talk about the issues that we heard that people care about, whether it's in, uh, environmental impacts, effectiveness, <coughs> animal effects. Um, that's um, going to be in the Pitkin County Courthouse starting around new on Pi Day, 3.14 day, March 14th. Uh -huh. and so we're really serving pie. So if you're in the area, we'll get you You're really serving pie? We're going to serve some pie. Tonight. Yes. That's great. That will be in that email I sent you all to. We'll send yep. you one to them. Yep. And that, that will also be filmed by Grassroots TV. And so if you can't get down there just like this, it'll be archived and we want you to check it out and learn all you can and participate. Thank you so much. Again, thank you for inviting us. So we'll be here for a few more minutes while we clean up. So feel free to come and talk to Dave up here. Um, and thanks again for coming.
Yeah. 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 Yeah.